Stanford University. Thanks, Tom, and good morning, everyone. To uh, echo Renee's sentiments, it's uh, always great for me to come back here. As some of you know, I have a long history with the institution dating back to musical antics before, during, and after football games, the year that Jim Plunkett won, Jim Plunkett won the Heisman Trophy. And I mention that because I'd like to begin by recalling George Santayana's famous admonition that he who does not remember the lesson of history is the lessons of history is condemned to repeat them. Specifically, I'll take you back to the turn of the 20th century, an age much like our own of dizzying technological and biomedical progress when the use of steam power had just become routine when another Menlo Park uh, entrepreneur, Mr. Thomas A. Edelman, um, Edison, was about to lose an argument with Mr. Westinghouse regarding the best way to make it possible for anyone to have electric light in their houses at the flip of a switch. And when certain dread diseases were yielding to biomedical progress. One of these diseases is diphtheria, uh, which was often fatal, uh, and for which in recent years, 114 years ago, uh, a biological therapy had been developed. You made a toxoid of diphtheria, you hyperimmunized a horse, you made the horse serum, and gave it, injected it into sick children. And there were side effects, but there was no question that it worked. However, in the late summer of 1901 in St. Louis, 13 children who were given this serum died, not of diphtheria, but of tetanus. It turned out that the material had been prepared um, from a horse, a bay horse, 16 hands high at the shoulder, weighing 1,600 pounds, housed in the St. Louis poorhouse stables and named Jim. Shortly after the serum had been released, the vet noted that Jim was ill and had him put down, subsequently diagnosing him as having had tetanus. And these children died as a result of having received uh, the contaminated serum. Uh, this article from the November 9, 1901 issue of the Journal of the American Medical Association is written by the fellow who prepared the serum and talks about every point that uh, led to uh, the, the tragedy and touches on all of the same things which remain predominating review issues of biologics to the present day. And I'd be happy to send anyone the, uh, the, the PDF who wants it. I su suggest this as reading for anyone concerned with uh, biologics therapeutics. This got the attention of Congress, who thought that with proper oversight, such future occurrences could be minimized, and in record time, an act to uh, uh, regulate the sale of, well, what we now call biologics, was passed and appeared for signature on the desk of President Theodore Roosevelt uh, by July 1, 1902, as you see. This is the Biologics Control Act of 1901. And to make a long story short and avoid getting into the weeds of chapter and verse of the um, federal regulations, which I'll touch on only briefly uh, during this talk, I'll simply mention that this was the beginning of our authority over, uh, according to various definitions, of biologics, including cell-based therapies. And since cell therapies are uh, the subject of today's discussion, I'll give you guys a little quiz. Anybody know the answer for sure, apart, of course, from my FDA colleagues? Well, Renee's been on our advisory <laughs> committee meetings, so she's kind of. I knew, but I know how to take tests. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. So, so what, we're, what my branch chief, Steve Bauer, and I are going to do today is first sketch some very broad uh, ideas about what the regulatory requirements are and how there is a relationship between biological characteristics that many in academic laboratories, such as those on this campus, uh, are studying, and regulatory requirements and how we get from um, the so-called basic uh, science um, types of studies to meeting these requirements. 
and I'm having trouble getting the uh, slide to advance now. Oh, how did I do that? Okay, what do I do? Because I didn't, yeah, I, know. I didn't I, touch any. I know. I don't know why it's doing this. Um, let's do play and. and no, that was and spontaneous. Then, and then uh, share. Okay, and then. This is go down to this. Oops. Here, wait a minute. I'm going to escape a moment and then we'll come back to okay. this. Sorry. If this will. There we go. Shrink. Shrink this. And go back to that. There. And hopefully we're good. Okay. All right. So. Basically, one point, the next point that we'll make is that there's really not that much of a difference between the types of um, analyses of biological phenomena that are commonly done in academic research and what is needed to meet regulatory requirements for these products uh, and draw the distinction between what is needed for initial exploratory trials and later for confirmatory trials that would support licensing a product and allowing it to be uh, sold. And finally, we're going to touch on some ideas uh, about how we can make a transition between the sort of trial and error empirical approach that's been used by many in the cell therapy community uh, until recently to uh, concepts which may allow the application of true engineering concepts to the design and manufacture and testing of these products. What we're not going to do is to formulate uh, uh, any new policy, change existing policy, or even hint at doing that at the podium. So we're going to talk about some scientific ideas that may help address these problems, but none of these uh, is um, intended to even suggest there are any changes in policy. What we're going to talk about fits entirely within existing regulatory frameworks. Now, the most important question that is asked before beginning clinical trials is the question as to whether human subjects are or would be exposed to an unreasonable and significant risk of illness or injury. There are other provisions in the regs for why we can uh, stop an IND from proceeding, but mostly they support the uh, decision that's articulated here on this slide. And the primary considerations that go into that are first, what's the potential benefit and how strong are the, the proof of concept data that you have that suggests that doing the experiment that would subject human subjects to risk is reasonable? Second, what are, what's the potential harm? How sensitive are your preclinical studies, whatever they are, to detecting possible safety problems? And third, what are the alternatives? How sick is the patient? What is the patient's life expectancy? what other therapies are available. And so you want to know something about where your material is coming from, something called uh, donor screening and testing, uh, testing of everything for um, adventitious agents, characterization of the product, which will be a major focus of the talk. Um, and uh, parenthetically, I'll mention that the FDA requirements are not the same as the requirements that has, have been outlined uh, by NIH for um, meeting other types of uh, concerns than ours. Second, what should your preclinical uh, proof of concept and safety testing be like? You want to, as much as possible, use models that reflect the human disease um, to give results that support a rationale for trying the experiment. There are limitations uh, in some systems. It depends on the disease. And sometimes this can be a, a major problem. I think you'll hear about this uh, from Bertha later on. Um, and finally, a, uh, an assessment of the safety. Uh, oftentimes, and I think Renee's talk already hinted at this, uh, there can be rare events that can be a problem. And so you need ways of assessing um, possibilities of, of rare but very bad events 
that are sensitive enough to provide reasonable assurance. And so finally, you need to choose a study population that helps to maximize the benefit to risk calculation um, and where and, uh, the proof of concept data are particularly strong. Um, and finally, uh, it could be argued in certain cases that the study design parameters, even for exploratory trials, uh, for, cells, for products like this, where there are certain unavoidable inherent risks, um, you might be able to detect a clinical benefit even very early on. So, as I said, the uh, characterization of the product uh, will be a major focus of, of what I'll talk about uh, next. And that's based on the concept that for biologics, there are three key things to control. Control of your source material, which can be sometimes as simple as certification from a vendor, uh, sometimes a combination of that and your own in-house testing, um, the uh, decision to use allergenic versus autologous cells, and of course, as always, careful attention to uh, microbiological safety. Second, control of the manufacturing process, characteristics of the manufacturing process design, the controls on the process to make sure that everything is going as it should be during manufacture, uh, validating the process to make sure that it's performing as you think it should be, and adherence to what are called good manufacturing processes. Um, I'm sure many of you get emails uh, about workshops that other people give on, on that topic, so I won't talk about that. And finally, control of materials uh, or product testing, which uh, is a particular challenge for cell-based therapies. Now, the, the concept is, of, of testing recognizes that you can't test quality into a product. Specifications of the product, as this uh, international conference on harmonization document indicates, are just one part of a total control strategy uh, that is designed to ensure product quality and consistency. And the document emphasizes that thorough characterization of the product is the, the key step. I'll say just a word for those of you who don't know what the ICH is. It's a consortium of the regulatory authorities of Europe, the United States, and Japan that sort of agree on um, a lot of general principles. And these ICH documents basically have the force of regulations in the three jurisdictions that participate. Now, I'll talk about characterization. Initially, when you're trying to analyze a product, you want to use as many different types of analysis as possible to figure out things about the product that may be useful in helping you control the process and test it for quality, perhaps to optimize the uh, process design. These tests can be sophisticated, powerful, slow, they might require somebody with very special hands to, to do them right. They can be labor intensive and expensive. And above all, they should be comprehensive, testing many different types of characteristics. Ultimately, you would like to select from those a small number of tests that is amenable uh, to uh, use in a manufacturing or production environment that can evaluate product safety, the consistency of the process and product, in the best of all possible worlds, predict the in vivo activity. Uh, and so the more you understand about your product and your process, uh, the better off you will be. You can go through this in uh, two stages. We talk about the so-called lifestyle approach to uh, product development. For initial trials, you need to be able to submit some sort of information to confirm that the product is what you say it is, the essential features of the product that make it appropriate to use uh, in ex experimental human subjects or product quality. Um, one essential part of this is microbiological safety. There may be product-specific characteristics that also require a, a special look. The purity. Does it contain the kinds of cells that you want? And does it not have problematic cells? And then how much? 
uh, strength or potency, and how will you dose? For um, cell products, some measure of how healthy the cells are, sometimes called viability, uh, and the cell number are basics, but it may be worth um, testing more sophisticated measures, and I'll get into that in a second. Now, unlike small molecule drugs, which have exponential decay as the hallmark of their uh, disposition, cells uh, might have a positive exponent. And because rare cells can matter, uh, this is kind of a big deal. And this is a fundamental difference, which means that for most of our products, uh, going back to that slide about the uh, unreasonable and significant risk, the risk is always significant. There might be microbial contamination, there might be rogue cells, and there's no getting away from that. So in addition to that issue, there are other challenges, short product lifetimes, uh, micro safety, as I just said, are always a, uh, uh, an issue. We don't know what happens to many of the cells much of the time, uh, and there are unknown risks. Cells could form tumors, misdifferentiate, they're very complex, we don't know what the process controls are, and we don't know what critical quality attributes are, uh, the and therefore the clinical benefit is variable and hard to demonstrate. Now for many of you this term CQA or QA may be new, so I'll say a little bit about what they are. This is the, although the term originated with industry, and we kind of like the term because attribute is very general. Sometimes people use marker or um, molecular characteristic or something like that. Not all of the things which are useful are molecules, and we just heard from Renee that there may be morphologic or even behavioral attributes that are useful, and we're going to hear more about that, I'm sure, um, from Tom and perhaps other speakers whose uh, talks I haven't heard yet. Um, and so it can be any kind of molecular or product characteristic that's helpful in, in uh, allowing us to gain useful information about how it's going to perform. And this is not such an easy problem. We now take for granted the life-saving ability of red cell transfusions. In fact, um, I'm here today because red cell transfusions, plural, saved my life when I was seven years old. Uh, the first, however, the first successful case report of this therapy dated from um, an incident in 1828, reported in the first uh, 1829 issue of The Lancet, by Dr. John Blundell, an obstetrician who had a patient with a postpartum hemorrhage who was in extremis with a heart rate of 120 that uh, when you could get her pulse at all, an uh, extreme pallor, who had been unresponsive to stimulants such as brandy and port wine. And uh, read, I, I suggest you read this article too. Um, and was uh, transfused from her husband who uh, if you read a blood banking text, you'll, you'll see that geneticists have figured out that given the population demographics of London at that time, that uh, the chances of a successful cross match were about 60% using this device, which, uh, uh, and shown here along with Dr. Blundell's patent. Now, in the intervening years, there were many serious problems with this therapy, fatal transfusion reactions, in fact, people became so discouraged, they started trying milk and, uh, uh, and other substances instead. It was not until we got a hint 75 years later from uh, Landsteiner's identification of uh, the ABO blood groups, and finally, uh, Ruben Ottenberg published a series of 128 patients in which he screened recipients and donors for agglutinative activity that we understood the quality attributes for uh, the most basic of cell therapies, red cells. So if some of us are struggling with how long it's taking us to get promising stem cell based therapies into the clinic, perhaps we should not be so hard on ourselves. This is not an easy problem and this may be a race that is not to the swift. So now I'm going to go through a couple of examples. One of the most commonly used attributes that's studied is 
well, viability or other uh, methods for assessing how good the cells are. Are there any things that, that might be useful than, more useful than canonical um, dye exclusion? What might be better? Well, here's a, uh, some work that was done at the University of Minnesota with pancreatic islets. In this slide, uh, everything, all of the islets that were tested except for one uh, on the very bottom here, um, I'm not sure which one is the laser, there we go, uh, were greater than 80% viable. And you might expect that uh, if this um, characteristic of dye exclusion meant something, that there would be a one-for-one -one correlation with the oxygen consumption rate of these cells, but there really isn't. Uh, the correlation is at best very, very poor. And this uh, explained um, in the investigators' minds why there had been such tremendous variability in success with pancreatic islet transplantation, both in experimental animals and in the few patients that had been tried. But if you look at, at other types of measures, here the ATP content um, uh, normalized to DNA, it was possible to quite clearly separate the green curve um, cells that worked from cells that didn't. And the p-value of 0.008 is, I think, generally pretty acceptable here. So this is a useful quality attribute for this product. Dye exclusion, not so much. Here's another case. These are expanded autologous chondrocytes. And a comparison is made with the ability of a score based on some molecular attributes uh, two terminal differentiation markers and four that are uh, related to various signaling pathways to the ability of a cellular product, these chondrocytes, to uh, take a, an implant from looking like this to looking like this. This is um, an intermediate stage of endochondral bone formation. These are uh, hypertrophic chondrocytes shown here with the metachromatic staining. And once again, a very good association could be established between this in vivo, the results in this in vivo assay and the performance based on this molecular marker uh, panel. So this, too, uh, gets, gives a hint of what might be useful quality attributes. In other words, you could take a look at an F15 and get a rough idea of what it is and where it's going, but you might have a much better uh, idea of what's happening by looking at its control panel. And indeed, uh, using the uh, Rosetta Stone not to sell language learning software, but to make a, a metaphorical point, many of the differences that are sometimes perceived between exploratory research and characterization studies, at least for these products, are more apparent than real because um, the same scientific questions are being asked, albeit with a slightly different vocabulary and with perhaps a slightly different um, intention. And some of the things that an academician might call uh, competence factors or uh, growth factors or receptors or uh, receptor inhibitors and whatnot would also be considered attributes. That could be useful, and I think many of you who, are, who study this will recognize the the cartoon uh, pathways being indicated here without me even telling you um, could lead to in-process and release tests. So our goal is to identify uh, quality attributes. And we've recognized how difficult this is for uh, folks. And as a result, um, try to help with some demonstration studies uh, within our division that my chief, Steve Bauer, will tell you about. Well, just quickly, a thanks to the people who put together this workshop. And um, my first time at Stanford, it's lovely out here. Hope to come back again. Um, so this issue of criti critical quality attributes, um, I think, is a crucial one facing the field. And this is just a very simplistic diagram of the way people envision uh, kind of cell therapies to work, that you can manufacture them, 
because they self-renew, they will understand uh, intrinsically how to undergo commitment differentiation and then terminally differentiate and give you the clinical effect that you want. But I think one thing to really um, remember is perhaps that the in vitro uh, manufacturing environment, maybe those canals, those banks are different um, from what happens in you know, a physiological setting for cells and that understanding how your manufacturing process affects cells is going to be a very important way to uh, lead to success for clinical uh, cell-based therapies. So the environment, whether it be uh, in vivo or in vitro in a manufacturing uh, setting is going to have a profound effect on the, the, um, the, the cells. And um, the real question here is what kind of strategies uh, will best identify these uh, quality attributes that are predictive of safety and efficacy. So I'm going to give a kind of vivid illustration of where we are in the uh, field of MSCs and some research at the FDA that's relevant to this question. A lot of people aren't aware that uh, there are many of us at the FDA who do research as well as do the regulatory work. So this is from some of our, our work there. Uh, what I'm going to be telling you is based on some publications, and the, the bottom of the slide shows uh, a sector overview that was done by an FDA commissioner's fellow named Mike Minicino and as others of us at the FDA, where we really looked at what kind of data are we seeing in INDs that relates to how people are characterizing their cells, what are they choosing for uh, quality attributes. Um, at looking at this, and as many of you are aware, MSCs are very diverse in many factors, but including how people characterize them, how they're manufactured, what the source is, whether it be bone marrow or adipose tissue or others, and uh, what are people using for quality attributes, how does that relate to performance in clinical trials. As you know, we haven't licensed any MSC-based cell therapies in the United States. But I also want to um, reemphasize a point Malcolm made earlier. None of this is intended to say FDA wants you to do or requires any of the kinds of experiments or analyses that I'll be talking about. We're trying to have a demonstration project that with certain approaches you might be able to better identify um, quality attributes. So this um, statement in bold here is to say that we really regulate each application on its own merits, and there's no FDA requirement for consistent nomenclature, manufacturing method, characterization method uh, across the industry, across the sector. So this is some data from that paper that I just mentioned that um, talks about what kind of measurements we see in INDs. So this was a review of 68 different INDs that came in between, I believe it was 2008 and 2012. And um, what you see here on the left is the, um, the rank based on percent of files that used different markers. And on the far right, you see a community consensus from the ISCT for a, a working definition um, what uh, an MSC is. Um, on the right, you'll see the ISCT had proposed ranges for different um, characterization. This is all based on flow cytometry, so cell surface markers. So m most of the ISCT um, criteria were among the top ranked. But some of the things I want to point out about this is if you look at the, um, the ranges of um, values for the percentage of cells that are um, going to express different cell surface markers almost always vary from what the ISCT criteria is. And again, this is not an endorsement or of the ISCT criteria per se from an FDA perspective, but I wanted just to give you an idea of kind of the variability in the data that we see and what people out there are choosing as their quality attributes. The other issue um, that was reviewed in that um, review of our INDs is how many of these markers are being used by IND sponsors as they go through product development. So anywhere in the IND means, you know, in the research and development phase, that's the um, 
one of the uh, columns in the average of in-process testing for flow cytometry, that reflects how people monitor their manufacturing. And then on the far right is really the bottom line, what is being used for lot release um, in terms of these criteria. And they can be quantitative or they can be qualitative. Um, quantitative being, you know, a percentage of a range or qualitative just being um, whether that, that marker's there or not. But what you see is, um, you know, that by the time you get to lot release, people are choosing to characterize their, their complex cell therapies with maybe three, three cell surface markers. So I think this is a vivid illustration of where we sort of currently are as an industry-wide survey in the, the, um, the choice of quality attributes. You know, we have a, quite a range of different sponsors, some of which are you know, cell biologists and some of whom are less so. So that doesn't reflect the whole industry, but this is a survey of what we see. So we thought as a demonstration project um, to sort of help illustrate how you can develop strategies to better identify quality attributes, we would um, d do a project on MSC characterization. So we formed what we call the MSC Consortium. and. Um, this next slide illustrates what our basic approach has been. Um, we've grown lots and lots of uh, bone marrow-derived MSCs, and I'll give a more details on how those were actually in our uh, manufactured, so to speak, in our, our facility, and then have a variety of laboratories, seven different PIs, and Malcolm uh, is in this group. Um, the Puri Lab is doing genomics, uh, Malcolm's group is um, doing um, single cell analyses and kind of pushing towards a systems biology approach for analysis of molecular attributes. And you'll hear a lot more of that after I finish. The Alterman lab is doing proteomics. Deb Hirsch's lab is doing um, genetic stability um, in terms of karyotypic analysis by sky and epigenetic screening of MSCs. And then the key point here is that we're aiming to use some of the, the characterization data and identify candidate attributes. And they could be molecular, they could be other, and I'll, I'll talk about that um, in, a, in a minute or so. But to correlate those with in vivo uh, animal models and in vitro bioassays in hopes that in an iterative stage-by-stage -stage way, we can find molecular signals that correlate with quantitative in vitro bioassays or uh, in vivo preclinical animal studies, and then eventually try to use those in, or, or suggest that they be used in clinical settings to better predict um, safety and um, effectiveness outcomes. So, these, this is where we started. We had eight different uh, bone marrow donors. We bought these from commercial sources so that other people could potentially replicate this work or use the same donors. There are uh, different ages range from 22 up to 47. Um, they were male and female. And um, we, what we did was passage these cells um, to passages three, five, or seven in culture, which is typical of what we see in a manufacturing environment, and then um, used one serum lot, because that's a source of variabilities in MSCs, and um, used a standardizing manufacturing approach uh, in my lab, and then started to do some characterization studies, which I'm just gonna give you um, a few of these uh, results. but. This is the sort of thing that we, we see if you look at proliferation um, with a, an imaging modality and look at cells at passage 3, 5, and 7, you can see that there's variation between samples from different donors and that in general you lose proliferative capacity. This is, has been pointed out multiple times in the literature, but we've done it in a systematic way with this set of donors in the context of correlating with these other uh, um, kind of more high throughput molecular characterizations. Um, the other thing that we see routinely is that the cell size increases with passage. And again, 
there's differences between the starting point and the end point of Passage 7 and the sizes that, uh, that you see from samples from different donors. Um, I didn't point out in this previous slide, um, two of our donors failed to proceed to Passage 7 and one even didn't go to Passage 5, and those happen to be the older donors. So um, there's some maybe preliminary uh, evidence here, but I think it's understood also that um, these kinds of cells at least um, don't perform as well in uh, manufacturing and perhaps in other biological functions as they do from younger donors. Um, this is cell uh, colony forming units, which is kind of commonly used as a uh, index of uh, what we call stemness for MSCs. That also falls off with passage and we saw differences between different donors. Uh, samples from donors. And we also developed in my lab a uh, adipogenic potential assay that uses imaging and automated microscopy to look at um, the, the differences between cells uh, from different donor samples and at different passages. And what you see here is a great diversity in the um, kind of progenitor frequency for what can form adipocytes. As you may be aware, MSCs are defined by um, some operational um, definitions, their ability to make fat, bone, and cartilage. So these are, you know, things that often in the industry are done qualitatively. Here we're trying to develop quantitative assays. And the, the encouraging thing to us about this sort of result is that you have a, a pretty great range of um, biological response and that these assays are fairly robust. If we do these in good numbers of replicates, we get the same answers if you look at the same cells from the same donor at the same passage. So uh, it gives you hope that you can pin molecular characteristics that correlate with this biological diversity. And this is, I think, is a very important point in terms of this discussion about quality attributes. This is a, a flow cytometric measure of all those cells from all those different donors and at all the different passages. And I've just shown you the, the heterogeneity in biological um, responses, proliferation rate, cell size, adipogenic potential, colony forming units. But if you look at the classical MSC markers and some others that are commonly used, and look at them at passages three, five, and seven, you don't see any differences. So what is being used by a great majority of our uh, community um, doesn't have any relationship to in vitro bioassay outcomes. So this is, a, a, I think, a striking and important point. The group has published this set of papers on um, quantitative differentiation assays, proteomic analysis of these different cells, um, an attempt to minimize variability in immunomodulation assays by using cloned mouse T cells rather than polyclonal human T cell populations in genomics, epigenetics, and I mentioned that sector overview. So just to summarize this portion of the talk, I think having quantitative functional assays um, is a way to ident you know, identify uh, and um, qualify predictive product characterization characteristics for cell therapy products. I've made this point that consistence markers don't correlate with this uh, functional heterogeneity. I think that's been an issue for development in the field. Um, I think the fact that we have robust assays that give us the same answer reproducibly suggests that there's subpopulations of cells in what's called an MSC um, population. And that sets the stage for uh, things that Malcolm will talk about um, in the next section of the talk. The goal of this is to sort of illustrate uh, strategies to finding better quali quality attributes. So we pu have published many of our findings and some of the potential uses um, are, include the following that, you know, you can identify differences between MS sample, MSC samples from different donors. So a way to screen donors for the characteristics that you want. You can evaluate the impact of tissue culture conditions and duration. You can correlate these molecular signatures with other characteristics of MSCs, and this could be used perhaps to guide enrichment techniques. You know, maybe you can prolong culture by enriching for the active stem-like population, in other words. 
and I think will eventually help us understand the mechanisms controlling uh, stem cell differentiation and function. So with that, we'll turn it back over to Malcolm. Thanks, Steve. <clears throat> well, Renee has already uh, set this up, and I guess it's fair to say that without belaboring it, Professor Waddington's impact has been such that even the FDA guy knows who he was. Um, and uh, point out that uh, a century or more of developmental biology experimental data gives us the, uh, the ideas that cell fate dec decisions are sequential, discrete, all or none, and mutually exclusive. And this leads directly into the um, idea again that when analyzing a bunch of cells, you might, with a conventional type of assay, this could be a Western blot or a conventional PCR, you grind up a bunch of cells and you analyze them and get uh, results in a stimulus response kind of experiment that might look the same depending on which of two situations you're going to get. In the first case, a graded response in which all of the cells are responding the same way and behaving the same way. Or in another case, the cells are not responding the same way. A few cells at a time are responding in an all or none fashion. A population-based assay wouldn't tell you, wouldn't be able to distinguish between these situations, but an, a an analysis cell by cell would. Now, one of the definitive experiments that set the stage for this was done right here uh, in the Farrell Laboratory, uh, as you see, um, quite some time ago. This was, what was done was to treat Xenopus oocytes with uh, a closely spaced uh, increasing series of concentrations of progesterone to mature them, uh, the maturation being measured by Western blots, and Xenopus oocytes are so big, they're a millimeter, that you can do Western blots on single cells of that size in duplicate, no problem. It's so easy that I've even done it myself. Um, and what you see when you look for the phosphorylation of MAP kinase is that at uh, a zero concentration, none of the cells has any phosphorylation. But even at the lowest concentration of 0 0.003 micromolar, you see a few cells with 100% um, phosphorylation, most of the cells with no phosphorylation. At no concentration do you ever see an intermediate level. It's always either all or none. The cells are basal or fully induced. Well, how do you do that in mammalian cells? We had done a bunch of studies with uh, conventional uh, qPCR, um, suggesting that we couldn't dis uh, make any finer distinctions than Steve showed with the, con with the conventional surface markers. Uh, I think we screened over 160 genes and didn't come up with anything terribly useful. So we decided to exploit this concept and look at single cell analysis in mammalian cells. There's a, a company nearby. We don't endorse specific vendors as a federal regulatory agency, um, but uh, the origins of this technology uh, do have roots here on campus. And what you can do is you can analyze in uh, uh, this type of an experiment, uh, 96 separate cells, each of 96 separate cells for 96 separate transcripts. And what you get is a sort of a, a heat map display. And here in, in this experiment, these are the same cells that uh, Steve talked about. Um, and they're all positive for the canonical markers, that figure of Steve's. Um, and what you see is that in this type of a display, each column is a specific uh, mRNA. We've moved the two duplicates next to each other for convenience. We actually randomized them through the chip uh, experimentally. And each uh, row is a single cell. And for a few things, like cell viability uh, genes, here we're showing gap DH, the cells look pretty much the same, 
uh, by expression level, which is uh, coded by this uh, color scale. Uh, a couple of the canonical markers, again, they pretty much look the same. Here's a cell that's missing one. We might call that an impurity. But, well, if these cells were otherwise similar, all the rows would look the same, and clearly they don't. So first conclusion is there is uh, heterogeneity among these cells that the canonical surface markers don't even begin to touch. Next, we looked at the, sensitive, the ability of conventional analysis to detect genes um, versus what can be accomplished with single cell analysis. Here are three genes, there are several that actually display this behavior, where the uh, uh, signal doesn't rise above the uh, fluorescence background until well, at, well beyond the limit of detection. These are important genes in stem cell differentiation, as I think most of you would recognize. And by conventional population average uh, analyses, we basically can't see them. But if we do single cell analyses, um, we do uh, easily detect uh, each of these genes. In fact, uh, we reach saturation many cycles before the limit of detection. So there's an ability to detect cells expressing rare cells that are expressing uh, these genes without much problem. Now, in fact, in addition to looking at things one gene at a time, let's look at an example. This is a proposal of a uh, so-called stem cell box, a, the simultaneous expression of uh, OCT4, SOX2, and NANOG as an indicator of stemness. This is considered a potential problem because of the possibility of misdifferentiation of very primitive cells. And when we analyzed these st same st cells for the, the presence of this box, we did find them, um, but at very low percentages. It's worth noting, and I'll come back to this uh, later on, that these percentages have never been associated with any kind of a safety issue for, for MSCs, but the stem cell box described by these authors is present. Do we know whether this stem cell box is a safety signal or not? I don't think so. I think we have to do further experiments. But it makes the point that not only can you detect rare cells expressing a single gene, you can, you can detect rare cells expressing a specific combinations, uh, a specific combinations of genes. And there are certain cir circumstances where I think this might be extremely useful. Indeed, going back to Professor Waddington, if we analyze the level of gene expression, we see basically that there is either nothing or uh, a basically log normal distribution of um, most of the genes that, that we looked at. Now, our sample was biased for things expected to have a role in, in cell fate specification. So they were, we, our, the things that we looked at were transcription factors, growth factors, receptors, growth factor antagonists, and so forth. Some cells have no detectable expression, and others easily measurable expression. Now, if we look at these, um, at the characteristics of the various genes, we find that some of them have a single mode of expression. These tend to be uh, cell viability genes. Others uh, can be detected pretty easily when they are present in a few cells, but we can still find them fairly easily. But most of the rest have uh, a distribution between uh, all-on and all-off uh, expression. One of the most striking things uh, I think that our data showed us was that we could sort various categories of genes. The unimodal expressors in this first box had a gene-to-gene -gene variation that was high uh, with respect, in, in this case, um, now we are analyzing only the cells which are expressing. 
compared to the genes in this category, which were all of the cell fate associated genes. And what I find very striking is that between three different cell sources, the expression level per cell for the cells that are expressing is very similar uh, from one uh, cell sample to the next, and even from one gene to the next, there's relatively little uh, variation, as though the information is encoded as presence or absence rather than level per cell. It doesn't seem to be dependent on the donor. Now, there is an explanation for this that's offered by systems biology uh, theory with very few assumptions. There's a phenomenon known as bistable regulation uh, characterized by a situation where below a threshold uh, the response to a stimulus is continuous. At the threshold there is a discontinuous response and the system is changed in an irreversible way so that the way back is not the way, same as the way forward. There is a biological memory that uh, really quite simple systems of ordinary differential equations would, will predict, giving us uh, a comfort that Professor Waddington was probably right. What we should do is look for things that are regulated in a bistable way. Now, this concept of discontinuous responses um, leads to the concept of what are called attractor states, situations where a system will converge toward an equilibrium state depending on where it starts of a stable equilibrium of one type or another. And these transitions occur across a sharp boundary. I won't go into the terminologies that are used here. But this idea of an attractor where there's a fairly wide um, space in a number of dimensions that will preserve a homeostasis is the systems biology explanation for the canalization phenomenon that Rene talked about. And probably ha something like this has to be the case because there is enough transcriptional noise such that the measured values that we see per cell vary over, uh, you know, 8 to 16 fold. So, well, there's uh, obviously more than one pathway op operative in a cell at one time. This whole concept can be projected into n dimensions, and in fact, one can use the mathematics uh, developed for, originally for quantum mechanics, to depict a system of all or none uh, responses in what systems biologists call a state vector, where the various growth factor pathways, and these are just a few favorites, but we don't really know for a given cell type, which ones or what the weighting factors are, um, can be um, subjected to uh, various types of matrix algebra. The visual metaphor for this is an old-fashioned dip switch, a, a gang of two position switches in a row. Um, and in fact, if you, if you do clustering analysis for a couple of subsets that look interesting to us, like the TGF betas, what we see is that there's not a single cell that expresses all of them but that there are a small set of particular patterns of co-expression from one cell to the next. This diagram almost kind of looks like a dip switch if you let your imagination uh, run a little wild. And so, well, how do we use this to analyze a population of cells? Looking at two of the donors that Steve showed, uh, the two that have the biggest difference in their ability to uh, uh, form adipocytes, we tried to find a few things where uh, there were differences. And well, the expression per cell was the same, but um, there, we thought that if we looked at the fraction expressing, we might be able to detect some differences. And for some of the genes, we actually do, um, although for the cell viability genes, the expression level and the cell fractions are the same. For others, we see quite dramatic differences um, in the fraction of cells expressing. And we think that that is probably how to be thinking about uh, analyzing complex populations of cells. In other words, from a mixture of various cell populations, here I've 
change the dip switch positions to red and green, what we really need to do is group them and count them um, and think about the differences between different samples as having to do with the relative sizes of the, of the pools of different cells. This leads us to an idea of progression down Waddington's landscape of successive uh, regions of homeostasis through these bistable transitions, one after another, eventually to arrive at a final state. Um, this might involve the uh, analysis, as Rene pointed out, of several different types of characteristics, including epigenetic uh, characteristics or attributes, uh, transcriptional attributes, protein phosphorylation attributes, and as we'll hear uh, later on, visual, morphologic, and behavioral attributes. I'd like to just touch on one specific additional uh, situation that is a bistable control mechanism, which is called the community effect. The, coin was, the term was coined by uh, John Gurdon in a, um, a paper from quite some years ago, describing the phenomenon that if muscle, mesodermal cells were separated, uh, they would not differentiate into muscle, but if they were clustered together, they would. And his theory was that there was a feed-forward mechanism where the cells talk to each other in such a way as to stabilize myogenic differentiation. Uh, one of the premier systems biology laboratories in the world, the, Der the uh, Davidson Lab, uh, pointed out just a couple of years ago that um, the community effect is, in fact, a mechanism of bistable control. Now, there are um, clinical situations, um, orthopedists who use autologous expanded chondrocytes basically report many anecdotes consistent with this, and we hear about this with uh, animal experiments from some of our sponsors, where you might expect that and control cells um, would give no type of an effect. If cells were responding in an intermediate way, you might see an intermediate effect. And if you had a particular, and that there might be a continuous type of response uh, as cells had greater or lower proportions of, of useful or not so useful cells. But that's not what you see. In practice, you, you continue to see either no effect for the autologous expanded chondrocytes, uh, practitioners tell me that these are older patients with chronic lesions and poor health habits, or very, very good effects, essentially complete cure. Now, that leads to the idea that maybe what we need to do is exploit this when, when it applies. And of course, this won't apply to every situation. Uh, and test the idea that the clinical benefit will, be, will depend on the number of cells that are in the correct discrete state. Above a certain threshold for good or ill, the community effect will kick in and stabilize what you want, or if they're bad cells, stabilize what you don't want. We have to look at both ends of it. These were muscle cells, and perhaps um, uh, there's a, a hint there of encouragement for a, a Bertha's uh, um, efforts. We'll see. So to summarize, a lot of MSC genes are under bistable control. I'm pretty sure this will apply to lots of other types of therapies. And single cell analysis can do things for you that other types of analyses haven't been able to yet. Uh, identify previously undetected population heterogeneity, detect uh, rare important cells. Uh, it does support, although it doesn't prove the concept of discrete attractor states, and does suggest that population differences are due to, in large part, to variations in the fraction, in subpopulation fractions. And what that probably opens the door, door to, at least I would like to think, is optimi optimization of the dose by being able to select, as Steve pointed out, the right cells, um, allowing, by virtue of increased discriminating power, to detect process variability to more consistent products, even if the treatment effect doesn't change, there is a better chance in a confirmatory trial of achieving success. Uh, 
mathematically tractable models if binary transitions, in fact, are what we see, and ultimately to the application of quality by design principles. The concept of an attractor fits directly into the quality by design principle of design space. This is a pharmaceutical concept that I think is intended as a teaser for another talk, um, but I think is worth planting the seed about now. There remain open questions. I think we've already discussed what are the links between functional, morphological, and molecular attributes. Um, I think we do need to identify various different types of attributes and correlate them. It could be that in, in certain situations we might require more than one cell type. We may not need to be shooting for absolute purity. And well, at a minimum, I think we can use uh, systems approaches to improve our manufacture, whether it's purification, differentiation protocols, better design and control of the process, and uh, improved in process and release testing. And finally, I'd like to um, acknowledge uh, all of uh, the collaborators within the consortium. I'll single out in my lab, Sam Rosenbaum, who's spearheaded the single cell efforts with the assistance of postbacs Jennifer Mitchadis and Alexa Bianchi and bioinformatic help from Elaine Thompson, the Bauer Lab and Jessica Lasordo, who grew up all the cells, uh, and the um, discussions and feedback from everybody in the funding and in the um, consortium and the funding uh, from within the, within the agency to support this. You guys are always welcome to contact us at any time. And I'll stop here. Thank you for your attention and field questions if we have time for that. Oh, and I should, I'm also instructed to let you guys know that there is a position open within our uh, <laughs> division. Yes? I have two questions. Yes. First one is, um, if you look at the protein expression, so that might be a complicated you know, picture, right? Because I'm very surprised by the expression of nano, SOX2, and maybe SOX4. Maybe I mean, you didn't look at that, but in, in adults themselves. We were too. And, but maybe it's just noise, so there's no protein, or maybe there are microRNAs which are actually compensating for it. I'll go, is that? Which leads to the second question. Okay. Like, so if you, so now you're looking at adults themselves, and this kind of complicates a lot when it comes to in vitro derived stem cells from embryonic stem cells. So what cell type, I mean, do you decide to transplant or to use for therapeutic <coughs> applications? Because according to what you see, I mean, let's, let's go just by nano and substitute expression chart. Those are embryonic stem cell markers, and they should be excluded by, you know. So, well, well, should it? Where, where do you draw the line? Well, should should is a difficult word, um, <laughs> and 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 your and and your points are um, are very well taken. Um, in particular, um, it w would be useful to look at RNA attributes and protein attributes. Now, they're just a, a small, of all the possible um, types of network motifs that would generate stable ce uh, cell states, there are only a few that are actually observed. And prominent among them were the feed-forward transcriptional loop and uh, protein phosphorylation cascades, which combine zero or ultra sensitivity and multi-step signaling and even cooperative binding. And probably looking at phosphorylation events, um, which, cap, which capture short time frame phenomena uh, and transcriptional events, which have a, a longer time constant simultaneously, ideally in the same cell, um, although the ways for doing that for lots of different attributes aren't here yet, uh, would be quite useful. Protein expression could function as a sort of a time filter because the turnover of proteins might be different than the turnover of RNAs. And as you say, there is noise. Um, those levels in those cells that are expressing are well above you know, threshold. So the question is, um, how, many, how many cells do you, um, does a statistician start to tell you actually mean something? And I think that needs to be verified in large part 
by, exper by experiment. Um, I think there are folks in the room who've had a lot to do with efforts to figure out what is the maximum allowable number of problematic cells in a product. Uh, and, and really, that type of qualification data is uh, extremely important. If you're well below that threshold, um, then um, maybe you, you know something useful. But um, we have to understand where that threshold is uh, and how reliable our measurements of that threshold are before we can make definitive conclusions. The next talk will actually, um, I'm sure, open the question of reliability of measurements and measurement assurance. Um, so um, I'm not quite sure if that's the definitive answer to your question. I think it does remain in the open questions category. Yes, Kevin. Um, this is a question, uh, it's related to the MSC piece, and it might be more directed to Steve, but I noted um, within the, the donor pool, it's mostly people in their 20s, you had a couple people in their 40s that you mentioned had failed. I'm wondering if that age bracket is representative of the ages of donors that have come in with prior IND submissions, and what you think the implications are for, say, autologous products which by large be effective over populations. Well, I was just going to point that out. In, in the uh, allogeneic setting, what we've seen is a trend towards younger donors. In the autologous, you know, that's what you have to work with. But I think that's an important point about, you know, is, this is a consideration. What's the capability of the cell's population that you're <laughs> manufacturing from an older individual versus younger? And I'm not, this is not a statistically significant sample, but there is literature in the MSC world showing, you know, that um, there are less frequent uh, CFU type cells in the bone marrow of older donors versus younger donors. And um, so it's not particularly surprising. <clears throat> Let me make one comment. Um, our data suggests that the difference between one donor or donor sample and the next has to do not with some global difference, but the relative fractions of different kinds of cells. And so I might have many fewer of a good type of cell than an 18-year-old Stanford student, um, but I may have them. And so the possibility of being able to identify them and perhaps on those find a set, one or two surface antigens that could be used with for a separation to pull them out, and maybe you would need a bigger aspirate from me than from the 18-year-old, maybe a much bigger aspirate, uh, and get, get above that community effect threshold is, well, yet another open question. I think it's actually kind of encouraging in that I think it suggests the possibility that there would be a way around uh, the fact that uh, I'm 62. <laughs> Bertha had a question. Um, I just wanted to go back to a more fundamental sure. uh, understanding of this, uh, or this, this term, quality attributes. Sure. Um, because how you determine a quality attribute has to do with the ultimate effect, the in vivo effect. Um, but the truth is, that, let's use mesenchymal stem cells as an example. They actually have a lot of effects not just in producing the adipocytes, the muscle cells, and, and both. Uh, along the way, they are actually altering intracellular matrix. Along the way, they are healing. There, there are a lot of goals that are not measurable yet because we don't really understand those mechanisms very well. So to define that a quality attribute seems to me problematic. <laughs> well, that's the point. <laughs> yes. Well, well, the holy grail is to tie something that we can measure in a reliable way or some set of things that we can measure in a reliable way with biology that we care about. And sometimes that is really difficult. That's why this idea of another workshop to look at the in vivo stuff I think is a good idea. Um, and um, it's often not so cut and dried. That's why, um, well, it took 85 years between, between Dr. Blundell and Ottenberg in 1913 to work out red cells. It was hard. 
given the technology of the time. This problem is hard, and you've put your finger on exactly, you know, what is, what is the, the fundamental difficulty. So in your, uh, for your agency, uh, in addition to demonstrating this biological hardcore effect, do you also consider evidence uh, based on uh, mechanism of action? Well, it depends a little bit on which question. For initial trials, remember, the criterion is unreasonable and significant risk of illness or injury, which is a different bar than safe and effective, which is the criterion for licensure. Um, the um, mechanism of action is certainly helpful to know, especially in, in looking for things to measure in preclinical studies and in clinical studies, but I don't think we know for sure even the mechanism of action of aspirin definitively. Uh, so um, it's not a regulatory requirement. Steve? Uh, yeah, just one f uh, further comment on your previous question. You know, I gave you some examples of, you know, developing bioassays for some characteristics of MSCs, but that, you know, not to say that you know, we, we think there are subpopulations present in these cell, when people are manufacturing them, and that um, there might very well be different subpopulations responsible for different clinical effects, so keep that in mind. So we looked at things that are sort of the canonical definition of MSCs, um, well, adipogenesis being one of them, but immunosuppression, you know, could be a totally different subpopulation, probably is, so. We just don't know yet which, you know, which ones to focus on. Or we have some ideas, but yeah. Pat, you had a question. Yeah, I would just like to throw out, um, uh, to get to Dr. Vittorio's question and some of the things that, um, that Renee said, um, uh, just to, to bring up another little thing about um, some of the uh, modeling and, um, and uh, determination of bivariate, uh, bivariate response functions. Um, you know, I, I'm wondering if, um, you know, it's, it seems like in MSCs um, that there are uh, discrete subpopulations, right, that once the cells start going into senescence or, or getting older in passage that they, they do change their character and maybe they're less active, et cetera. Um, but um, but with, a, with a, a different kind of cell like, a, like an IPSC, does, does, you know, is that cell perhaps more flexible? To go back and forth across across boundaries, and um, you know, and, and uh, we've certainly seen places where um, one could uh, could interpret data as bivariate or a dis or, or a continuous distribution of responses. Um, you know, and, and a lot of times it depends on how it looks. Depends on whether you're looking at the response in long space or in linear space. And sometimes if you look in linear space, you'll see something that is a continuous distribution, which if you plot in log space, depending upon the scales, it will look like it's bivariate, like, it, like it's bimodal. Um, and, 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 you know, and I just wonder if this is not just a, you know, a really fine detail uh, that's you know, sort of academic in nature uh, for you know, finding models that might be predictive, but, all, but if, if it might actually also be important from the point of view of which cell type are you looking at. You know, uh, if MSCs, for example, do have bivariate nature, then you could think of doing a separation out of a population of those cells that would be active and discarding those cells that aren't. But if you're looking at a population that, in fact, isn't really a bivariate but a continuous distribution, you could do a separation, but yet that population then might have the potential to create that entire distribution again. So I just throw that out there. I don't think it's something that we're going to solve today, but you know, just as a, an interesting um, maybe research uh, and <coughs> difference in applications of the different cell types on their, their state. Don't you have data on that, Anne? I'm sorry? Don't you have data on the Yeah, I mean, that's what, uh, you know, and of course what, what our experiments were doing were, were looking uh, at somatic cells. You know, they weren't stem cells at all. So, um, but, you know, your caution about uh, teratomas and uh, ability to differentiate or ability not to, um, you, you know, their they're mm. MSCs may be different from IPSCs. Well, it wouldn't surprise me if they were. Two points. Um, models 
you start with what you know and you construct a model and then you try and destroy the model with uh, perturbation studies and figure out what your parameters are. And there's been some success at doing this. Um, and it's an iterative process, you know, your model doesn't work, you tweak the model, you do more experiments and, and, and so forth. And so, I mean, the definitive answer to your question is I think in going to be in, in the future. You know, with respect to, to our data and the bi bimodality, uh, the separation between between zero and um, you know a fair a fair amount of RNA per, per cell, I think would be robust to uh, a change in the axes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. For more, please visit us at Stanford.edu.